This presentation is about passive cooling systems. Here you can see the bundle diagram about passively cooled building in a hot arid climate. This is from the passively cooled building bundle in the printed volume of the third edition of Sun, Wind and Light. The bundle diagram shows strategies that are applicable for most of the time for a building in this situation. As you may know, if you've taken a look at the bundle diagrams in the bundle sections, you'll find that there's a variation for each bundle. Sometimes there's two, sometimes there's three. And the variable which drives the variation in the bundles uh, can be different things. In this case, it's a climate. And so there's a bundle for a hot arid building and one for a hot humid building. And so this, uh, this lecture will be mostly dealing with uh, level four, the scale of the rooms. So we'll look at a variety of different systems like night cool mass, evaporative cooling towers, stack ventilation, wind catchers, uh, and also one that's not pictured here, cross ventilation. So you can take a look for more information about the various different passive cooling systems and how they compare with each other in the passive cooling bundle. But we're going to break those down one at a time here. Okay, let's start with the simplest, which is cross ventilation. On the right is a building from Alabama. This is a residence in central Alabama. And you can see it has a whole bunch of features that are typical of operating in a hot, humid climate uh, before the advent of air conditioning. So the building is raised off the ground. It allows for some air circulation under the building. Uh, in fact, sometimes the inlets would be underneath the building. But in this case, it also raises it out of the dampness of the ground in this hot and humid kind of swampy-like climate. There's also a, a series of wraparound porches. So there's the interior building that's inside the envelope. And then there's a kind of wrapper or a layer of space around that, which not only serves to shade and protect the walls themselves and the windows that it tend to admit solar gain, but also provide an opportunity for a breezy outdoor space that's in the shade. And if one side of the building happens to be in the shade, you can move around to the other side of the building uh, and catch some sun or vice versa. Uh, you can also see that the windows are quite large and that underneath the, uh, even underneath the porch, there are exterior shutters. The shutters are louvered. That allows you to get privacy, maybe keep out some light, close it at night, but still get ventilation or if the sun happens to be penetrating under the deep overhang of the porch, you can also close it to create additional shade. Up in the top, you'll see some dormers, uh, and those dormers are not actually for admitting light, they're for ventilating the attic. So this would not have been an occupied attic in this type of a climate. So that serves to kind of create this layer uh, across the top that um, uh, can allow the solar gain to be uh, dealt with before it reaches the ceiling below. And the dormers would be to ventilate out that attic. Uh, so a variety of sort of basic vernacular forms that deal with keeping the sun off of the building and allowing the air to move through. On the left you see a site plan uh, and this is here to make the point that just like in a building we need an inlet and an outlet. We need a positive pressure and we need a negative pressure. And if we can figure out where the pressures are in any particular building or floor plan or section, then we can generally make uh, an assumption about which way the air is going to be moving because it's always going to be moving from a high pressure area to a low pressure area. So um, the space or the courtyard or the, um, the sort of shared space in between these groups of buildings is open. It allows the air to move in through one end and exit out through the other end. Also, uh, this is showing a kind of rotated um, organization for the orientation relative to the wind. And so one of the things that that uh, emphasizes is that if you have a rotated organization, then you get a positive pressure on the windward side for two sides of the building and a negative pressure on the other two sides. Whereas if you face the opening directly towards the wind, you're getting a positive pressure on that side when the wind's blowing from that direction, but then a negative pressure on three sides. So you have to make sure in that case that your 
inlet sizes work with just one orientation. So this rotated organization tends to give more access to the wind for more buildings and for more surfaces on each building. Here's an example of perhaps the extreme of a cross-ventilated building. Uh, this is in Martinique. It's an academic building. And you can see that the entire wall is essentially uh, louvered. So there's, uh, the entire wall can be opened up, and that means that you can ventilate out whatever heat is being built up almost immediately from the inside. So the inside temperature would be very close to the outside temperature. Um, and uh, it would also operate really well at low velocity wind speeds. And then in the left image, you can also see that there's an extensive shading on that facade to keep the direct sun uh, from ever really hitting the facade itself. On another portion of that building, there are these large ailerons that kind of tune to the direction of the prevailing wind to help begin to turn the wind into another part of the building. So if the wind is not coming um, perpendicular or near perpendicular to the windows, then you can actually do some things with either built form or with vegetation to help to turn the wind in. So on the right you see an example of that with vegetation. Um, on the upper image, uh, having the vegetation added that helps to turn the prevailing wind in through the openings and create a positive pressure on the inlet side um, and more of a negative pressure on the outlet side. Here's a couple of examples again from the south. On the right from Natchez, Mississippi, uh, kind of double height porches. So you can see on the on the sunny facade, um, a building that really takes that layer of space um, pretty far in terms of keeping the um, creating a layer of, of shade along the sunny facade. And again, those exterior shutters that allow even when the sun does reach the facade to reduce that or to make sure that you have a combination of security, uh, privacy, and still get ventilation at night. Notice how large those windows are and how vertical they are also. On the left-hand side, uh, you see this all over the many of the southern states, the kind of prototy prototype of the dog trot house. So it's basically it's two rooms, one on the left and one on the right, that are enclosed with an attic space, uh, a loft space that connects them across the top, and then an open breezeway or dog trot through the middle. So this is using the Venturi effect. Uh, this would be facing the prevailing winds, um, typically towards the southerly winds. Um, and oftentimes you'd see a porch um, also along the south facade there. Um, but in this case, no porch, uh, just the breezeway in the middle. So um, let's say about half of the air that's hitting those solid portions on the left and the right gets funneled in, th in through that dog trot plus it picks up the air that's already arriving at the dog trot. So it's squeezing twice as much air through a smaller volume. And when that happens, the velocity picks up. So that would be the coolest, breeziest place uh, to sit out and do your work or uh, just relax during a hot day in the summer. This is a variation on cross ventilation that we called wind catchers. This is a separate uh, strategy that can be found in sun, wind, and light. It is called wind catchers, uh, whereas the basic strategy for cross ventilation is called cross ventilation rooms. On the left, you see an example of wind catchers from Pakistan. This would be uh, a kind of wind regime in which the prevailing winds are coming from a predominant constant orientation. So you see that these, these uh, sort of heads on the top of the wind towers are all pointed in the same direction. So the wind tower or the wind catcher does some unique things. Um, one, it works well in a more dense urban environment because the upwind buildings are going to tend to block the wind for the downwind or leeward side buildings. So the first uh, building or two gets good, wind, gets good wind pressure and wind speed, but the, the successive uh, layers of buildings are likely to have their wind be blocked or have their velocity significantly reduced. So what the traditional strategy does is reaches up and grabs that wind from up high above the rooftops. And that does a couple of 
additional things. Not only does it mean that the openings for catching the wind can be oriented any direction, it also means that it's capturing cleaner air that's less dusty, it's cooler, and it's faster because the the higher you go up, the less drag there is, the less um, uh, friction from buildings, trees, terrain, things that are happening along the ground plane. So um, the image on the right uh, shows the efficiency of different types of wind catcher heads or uh, top um, designs. And these are basically based on the different uh, directions that the wind comes from. So that Pakistani type is from a singular direction. Um, there's the Iranian two-sided on the upper left. You can see that's really uh, if you had two opposing wind directions that were uh, predominant and common. Um, the Egyptian is sort of more three-sided but with a dominant um, single direction. And then there's this Iranian four-sided with a kind of X that goes vertically down through the middle of it. Uh, you can see the Iranian two-sided has that single plane coming down the middle. So the Iranian four-sided would be uh, a wind regime where the wind direction was coming from approximately equal directions or statistically that it could be coming from almost any direction. Here's an example of uh, wind catchers in practice. Um, this is uh, at Qatar University and you can see the uh, the section shows how each one of these little modules kind of pops up, catches the wind, brings it down into the space, uh, and then out through the uh, openings of the windows. Uh, these are, it's also, uh, as you might be able to tell on the left, uh, built around a whole series of courtyards. So quite a kind of uh, elegant but very modern application. Now here's two different uh, sizing charts. These basically work the same way, so I'm only going to demonstrate one of these. But on the left is the sizing of openings for cross ventilation, and on the right is the sizing of openings for wind catchers. And what you can see is they're very similar, except that the wind catchers are slightly more efficient. So what that means is that you need a little bit less aperture area for the wind catcher to do the same job of cooling. Um, that you use for the cross ventilation. So let's take a closer look at the graph called sizing openings for cross ventilation. This would show up in the ventilation apertures strategy. And uh, before you can actually use this chart you have to know something about the building's rate of heat gain. So if you're following along on the SWL tools you can estimate the heat gain rate for the building in quick heat gain. You can also e estimate it in a more detailed heat gain worksheet in that same uh, SWL tools Excel file. Or you can do it by hand in the analysis technique called total heat gains and heat losses. So the way we would start with this is first we would find the design wind speed. Now the design wind speed is not necessarily the airport wind speed. So what we would do is take the airport wind speed and the, we would modify it by terrain factor. And the terrain factor chart looks like this. So at the airport, the wind speed is measured about 10 meters off the ground. And so the value on this chart is 1.0 at 10 meters for the airport. So that's 100% of the airport measured wind speed. And so every other kind of terrain is either greater or lesser wind speeds in the airport. So if you're out at the beach in a very open location, uh, you might have more wind speed than the airport. If you're in a rural location, you've got some trees and some terrain, and as opposed to the very open condition of and, and mostly flat condition of an airport. Uh, suburban is uh, further wind reductions, and uh, in the middle of the large city, you have lots of buildings, lots of turbulence, lots of reductions in wind speed. So there's this terrain factor that we call, or the effect of the terrain on the local wind speed. Uh, also, you can see that the height above the ground uh, makes a significant impact. So if you're in a one-story building and the window, the middle of the window is down around four feet or so, you can say that that's much less wind speed than up at 10 meters or 32 feet uh, above the ground. So what we do is then pick your location based on the context of your site. If you're in a small city, you might as well pick suburban. Uh, 
if you're in a, a large city center that is with high-rise buildings um, then you could pick large city center that'll take care of most uh, conditions and then depending on which uh, level of the building you're analyzing uh, find the height which would be the average height of your inlets and outlets and that would be what you would use then to estimate the ratio of the local wind speed to the airport so for instance in the example we're looking at about 12 feet above the ground in a suburban location it comes out to about 0 0.5 as the ratio of local wind speed to airport wind speed at 10 meters above the ground so if the airport wind speed for instance is measured at 10 miles per hour and our ratio is 0 0.5 then the average wind speed on the site whenever it says 10 at the airport is going to be about 5 miles per hour at the local site and then once we know what the terrain factor is we'll multiply that times the original airport wind speed and then I like to add on a modification factor or a kind of safety factor that accounts for the fact that the airport wind speed is a kind of average speed if you're at least if you're working from average data and so if we multiply by a, a kind of modification factor of about 0.75 that takes care of almost all the instances and the reason we do this is because we don't want to size the passive cooling system uh, to not work half the time and if we're using the average wind speed then what that means is that half the time the wind speed is going to be slower than that about half the time it's going to be faster which is okay we'll get extra cooling out of that maybe we don't have to open the windows all the way but we certainly don't want to size the system based on the average speed we want to go for a relatively low speed okay so once we know the design wind speed we can enter that on the vertical axis then we travel horizontally until we meet the curve for the building heat gain rate which we will have previously established and then we're going to drop down from that intersection and find the inlet or outlet area as a ratio of the floor area so if it reads uh, 5% or 10% that means it's 10% of the floor area in inlets and another 10% in outlets. So then once we have that ratio we can multiply it by the floor area to find the actual area of the inlets or outlets and remember that the outlets need to be typically at least as large as the inlets. So let's move on to stack ventilation so here's two examples one uh, more contemporary on the right one more classical on the left and what you can gather from this is that the section is quite important in stack ventilation whereas in cross ventilation what we're really looking for is open plans we have an inlet on one side an outlet on the other side it's driven by the pressure of the wind we have to make sure that the air can move from one side of the building to the other in this case we have to make sure that the air can move from low to high through the section and the process is driven by the difference in height between the inlet and the outlet or what we call the stack height and what's great about stack ventilation is it's not dependent on wind speed so it's going to work whenever the building has a heat gain and uh, whether or not the wind is blowing so 24 7 you can be having stack ventilation if you have a cooling load and it works on the buoyancy or stack effect which means that as the building is gaining heat as it's it's gaining heat from conduction as it's gaining heat from the sun as it's gaining heat from um, lights people and equipment then the air is actually warming up as the air inside warms up it rises if it's got a place to go out then it's going to help to suck in some cooler outdoor air and that cycle will continue here's a couple of vernacular examples if you will on the left is a tobacco barn from a small farm in Virginia and on the right hops drying barns from Oregon and in both of these cases there's uh, lower inlets and higher outlets in the case of the tobacco barn on the left the inlets are actually in the cracks between the boards and the outlet you can see is a, a thin strip of uh, outlet opening along the ridge on the on the right you see the, the hops barns 
and we have windows for inlets all along and then we have these series of kind of monitors with their louvered outlets up above. So you'll see stack ventilation really quite prominent in agricultural buildings if you begin to look around. This is the pension building in Washington DC. It used to be called the pension building, now it's the National Building Museum. Uh, it was built in the mid-1800s and Abraham Lincoln actually had his inaugural ball on the floor of this building. Uh, but back in the late 1800s this would have had office workers all across the floor of the atrium. And so in this case uh, it's, it's essentially a very tall room inside the building. It's an atrium that's wrapped by a thin uh, layer of office building or, or wrapped by a thin layer of offices and then on inside of that a layer of circulation. So the air comes in from the outside along the edge uh, either through the windows or through little vents underneath the windows. It travels across the offices and then across the circulation and then up through the atrium and out clear stories at the top. This is the British Research Establishment. It's a kind of um, office building for the British organization that does uh, building research. It's by Field and Clegg and it has a whole bunch of different uh, stack ventilation strategies. Um, on the right you see the south facade with some stack ventilation chimneys. Those chimneys are faced with glass block and you can see the section on the upper left. So the air comes in either um, through the windows or through vents that go through a plenum across the top of offices so you can still have some closed off or cellular offices and still get ventilation to the open office um, on the south side. Uh, then the air enters for the lower two floors into those chimneys. The sun comes in and heats up the chimney through the glass block which is driving the stack effect even further because it's also driven not only by the height difference but by the temperature difference between the incoming air and the outgoing air. And so that's helping to make that warm air rise even faster. Uh, and then you can see that that chimney height is extended quite a bit up above the second floor. Note also that the third floor is not actually being ventilated by the chimneys. It's actually being ventilated separately because the roof itself can be changed so that it doesn't have to be a flat plate. In this case it's being tilted up and then making a clear story. So they're increasing the stack height, probably almost doubling the stack height from what might have been possible in only a, a flat space. Um, that allows the chimneys not to be so big and to only serve the lower two floors. In the lower left image you see a kind of great solution to a problem that comes up often when you're trying to do natural ventilation. So this is a, a conference room or a small auditorium and uh, so what you want there is you want some acoustic privacy. You also want to be able to have some uh, lighting control. So you need the inlets and the outlets to not be providing a lot of noise from outside and you also want it not to be providing too much light. So in this case the corridor is on the outside and is uh, operating or you know you can see in the section is at a different level. The air comes in under the corridor space. Uh, it's brought in sort of under the floor and then enters through vents in the bottom of the wall. Moves up through the space as it warms up. Moves through a perforated ceiling and then out through a chimney. Notice the chimney has louvers at the bottom for light and louvers at the top for rain and light. So solving all of those problems of lighting and acoustics in a room that you might want to be quiet and dark sometimes but still get ventilated and you don't want to have to make those difficult choices. This is perhaps the most extreme version of a stack ventilated building that I can find. It's called the Queen's Building at De Montfort University by Short and Ford. Short and Ford do a lot of um, projects or consulting with other architects where stack ventilation and natural ventilation and passive cooling is concerned. Uh, and you can see a number of different strategies. See the auditorium in section where the air is being brought in from the exterior wall underneath coming up you know, so the, the coolest air comes right up under the feet of people um, through the risers in the um, seating system 
and then out through a dedicated chimney again so that light can be controlled, acoustics can be controlled. Um, on the upper levels there are tall rooms with clear stories. Um, some rooms are ventilated with dedicated chimneys. Um, so just a kind of a, a symphony of stack ventilation. Here's the exterior. This is actually an engineering school, so they're both laboratories and um, kind of studio type spaces. This uses a combination of um, wind catcher and stack ventilation and uh, a form of evaporative cooling. This is by Hassan Fathi, the Egyptian architect, who's a contemporary architect, um, now deceased, but was working in, at the time um, in traditional mud brick materials with traditional Egyptian construction, um, but using the insights and the knowledge from contemporary building science about heat gain, heat loss, how buildings can be cooled, how air moves, and so forth. So what I want to focus on is this a space through the souk, which is a kind of market space. You can see the wind catcher that reaches up high above the top of the building to catch the cooler, dust-free uh, prevailing winds. Brings that air down through a shaft, and in that shaft there's actually suspended ceramic terracotta pots that are filled with water, and those are kind of moving moisture through the ceramic so that it's um, evaporating into the air and helping to cool the air evaporatively. We'll talk about evaporative cooling a little bit more in just a minute. Uh, then it takes that air down through the basement space. That basement space is sort of like a, a cooler or for the vegetables. And so at night all of the vegetables from the market that weren't sold would be moved down to the basement for cool storage. Uh, and then there's a stack ventilation tower on the other side with an updraft and you can see the kind of you know extreme height of both of these things. Uh, so there's a kind of um, pushing down from the evaporative cooling uh, that's helping the air to fall and from the pressure of the wind catcher on one side and then a pulling up and out from the stack pressure lifting up on the other side. So you can begin to see that these systems can be hybridized. So that's the end of part one on passive cooling systems. Take a look at part two where we'll pick up with night cool mass and evaporative cooling.